On the evening of December 1st, several northern regions in China, including Beijing, witnessed a blood red aurora borealis. This aurora phenomenon is believed to be a result of exceptionally intense geomagnetic storm activity, unlike anything seen in history. Normally, auroras are seen as green, but this time they appeared in a striking shade of red in these locations. What's more astonishing, Beijing is located at approximately 40 degrees north latitude, but the red sky can still be seen. Video shared by residents in Hue Ro district in Beijing capture the night sky turning a deep crimson around 8 p.m., intensifying in color before gradually fading away. Residents in the Mentougou area west of Beijing also reported witnessing the red aurora. According to theories in astronomy and physics, auroras are typically the result of high-energy particles from the sun or the cosmos colliding with Earth's magnetic field and entering the Earth's atmosphere along its magnetic lines, particularly near the north and south magnetic poles. Dr. John Mason, a physicist and astronomer, explained that all aurora activities is a consequence of charged particles entering the atmosphere at incredibly high speeds, leading to collision with air particles in the upper atmosphere. According to some scientific sources, in regions of the ion sphere located very high above the Earth's surface, above 300 kilometers or 180 miles, oxygen exists in the form of atoms and is the most common one. Collisions there can produce the rare red auroras. The most common and intense yellow-green auroras are generated through oxygen collision in the lower altitude regions, typically between 100 and 300 kilometers. Therefore, the appearance of red auroras in the low-latitude northern regions of China is exceptionally rare. In addition, in recent years, China has witnessed a series of unusual phenomena. In August, Areas including Jing'an in Shandong province also experienced red skies. In the same month, a 5.5 magnitude earthquake occurred in Shandong. In August, a massive blood moon appears suddenly in Zhaoyang, Hubei province, sending shivers down the spines of onlookers. The moon in the sky, a blood moon, such a huge moon. Has anyone ever seen a red moon like this? This is in Taiping town, Zhaoyang, Hubei province. On September 22nd of last year, many areas in Hubei province were unexpectedly blanketed in heavy snow, marking an unusual climate event. This is September 22nd. Look, it's snowing. In May of the same year, a vast and unexpected snowfall covered Pingshan town in Shijiazhuang, Hubei province, China. It was hard to believe that such an event could occur in China, so close to summer. In ancient Chinese culture, snow in June was considered a symbol of unsettled grievances. In August, following a heavy rainfall in Xintai, Hubei province, numerous stones were found scattered across an Ulsford road. Some internet users humorously remarked that the stones had started sprouting. Furthermore, this August, a multitude of fish leaped out of water in Dianqi Lake, Yunnan province. Such occurrences are often viewed as omens of impending disasters. Why have there been frequent anomalies in China in recent years? It is highly likely that they are related to the evil rule of the Chinese Communist Party. Ancient Chinese people believe that good deeds bring good results, while evil deeds bring bad consequences. People believe that all disasters in the world originate from wrongdoing, and the occurrence of anomalies signifies that commodity is approaching. Conversely, if the weather is favorable and crops are abundant, it represents kindness and happiness. Comparing the actions of the CCP today, it is clear that this party has been involved in actions that harm and take lives. It is not difficult to see that these anomalies are aimed at the evil deeds of the CCP. Since a blood red sky has occurred again in Beijing, let's take a moment to review the bloodstained history of the CCP. Since the CCP came to power in 1949, it has conducted large-scale massacres and various campaigns in mainland China. These campaigns have led to the unnatural death of at least 80 million Chinese people. In 1951 and 1952, the CCP launched the three anti and five anti campaigns. During this period, the CCP's leader Mao Zedong initiated a purification campaign, ostensibly aimed at eliminating corruption in Chinese cities and dealing with national enemies. Just a few years after the establishment of the People's Republic of China, 
However, this campaign evolved into a series of political crackdowns against Mao's political opponent and capitalists, particularly wealthy capitalists, ultimately solidifying Mao's authoritarian rule. Throughout this process, it is estimated that around 20,000 cadres and 6,000 trained workers were assigned to monitor the business affairs and personal lives of their fellow citizens. Chinese media had already become a part of the CCP's propaganda machinery by that time. By the end of 1951, as many as 15,000 specially trained propagandists were working in Shanghai. Reports indicate that a large number of private entrepreneurs were fined or prosecuted during the Anti-5 campaign. The CCP used fabricated charges such as assuming illegal income to punish these entrepreneurs. In reality, many of them were falsely accused, yet the CCP subjected many capitalists to torture, violence, and even direct execution during the campaign. In the late 1950s to the early 1960s, the CCP was responsible for a devastating famine that lasted for at least three years. At least 35 million people died of it. Due to the lack of food, people consumed virtually anything edible and inedible, with no grain available. Those suffering from hunger resorted to digging wild vegetables in the field, eating tree bark, and in some areas even consuming soil. This soil, known as high alumina soil, contained some minerals, but was far from suitable as food. According to accounts from the older generation, during that time, many individuals in every village succumbed to starvation. No need to mention about eating meat. They couldn't even find enough grains to eat. There's a heartbreaking story of one family where a man had gone without food for a long time. Before he passed away, he left a wish, hoping to have a mouthful of sweet potato flour before his death. Unfortunately, he never got to fulfill that wish. In fact, the three-year Great Famine was not a natural disaster, but a deliberate man-made catastrophe. In 1958, Mao initiated the Great Leap Forward, encouraging mass steel production across the country. Almost every Chinese citizen was pulled into steel production, causing widespread chaos. It is said that even household utensils, anything that could be used to melt iron, had to be turned over to the state for steel production. This extreme and misguided policy disrupted the social structure, nearly collapsing the industrial chain. Nobody was responsible for farming. Nobody was responsible for harvesting. People had no food, no cooking utensils, and no new clothes. Hunger and inadequate clothing became the norm in society. During this absurd era, the CCP's Great Leap Forward directly caused the death of over 30 million people due to starvation. Yang Jishen, a former professor at the Chinese Academy of Journalism and Communication and a renowned scholar, stated that comprehending the death of 36 million people due to starvation is staggering. This number is equivalent to 450 times the number of people killed by the atomic bomb dropped in Nagasaki on August 9, 1945. On that day, the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima by the U.S. caused 71,000 deaths. On August 9, another atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, causing 80,000 deaths. In other words, the Great Famine in China was equivalent to dropping 450 atomic bombs on Chinese rural areas. History has shown that the CCP's movement have been relentless. In the years following the Great Famine, the Cultural Revolution began in 1966, marking another catastrophic period in Chinese history. The Cultural Revolution was a nationwide political movement initiated by Mao himself. Yes, it was Mao again. As you'll find in the subsequent history, nearly all of the CCP's leaders were implicated in acts of violence. During the Cultural Revolution, millions of unjust cases were manufactured and numerous officials, intellectuals, and ordinary people endured brutal prosecution. Countless civilians, including high-ranking CCP officials, suffered persecution to the point of death, bearing unjust accusations. Over the course of a decade of the Cultural Revolution, education was severely disrupted, with all schools in the country forced into recess. College entrance examinations were cancelled. It wasn't until 1977, after the end of the Cultural Revolution, that the exams were reinstated. In this movement, not only did the physical well-being of the Chinese people suffer immense devastation, but traditional Chinese moral values were nearly destroyed. Almost all ancient buildings, temples, and Buddhist shrines were demolished. The Red Guards, who participated in the destruction, spared not even the Buddhist statues. They publicly destroyed these statues and even forced monks and nuns to renounce their beliefs, compelling them to abandon their faith. During that time, anyone labelled as 
rightist had to undergo mass struggle sessions involving hundreds or even thousands of people. Even their own families turned against them. It seems as if all Chinese people were brainwashed into a frenzy, recognizing only the CCP, but not traditional moral values, not the divine, and certainly not their own family members. The entire China became a hellish place of people against people, people hating people. A colossal catastrophe that simultaneously ravaged both the spirit and the body. After much struggle, China gradually entered modern society when Deng Xiaoping announced the policy of reform and opening up in the 1980s. However, rampant corruption continued to plague China's officialdom, business sectors and educational institutions. Similar to Japan and South Korea, China also went through a phase of desiring a transition towards democratization. During the economic crisis and political corruption, China's two top universities, Tsinghua University and Peking University, witnessed student protest. The students demanded democratization and liberalization from the CCP. At the time, the then national leader, Hu Yaobang, seemed inclined towards pursuing this path. However, shortly after Hu's death, large-scale student protests erupted. His successor, Zhao Ziyang, also attempted to support the students in Changjing China's status quo. Unfortunately, true power rested in the hands of Deng Xiaoping. The fundamentally sinister nature of the CCP remained unaltered. As Zhao Ziying was brought under control, the students' demand at Tiananmen Square went unanswered. Then a brutal crackdown on the students happened. Deng Xiaoping ordered the massacre of the protesting university students. Overnight on June 4, 1989, the CCP deployed the military and tanks to open fire on unarmed students and citizens. Countless young lives were cut short in moments. Falling under the barrage of machine gunfire crushed beneath the tank threads and amidst the cries of friends and family. This movement marked the complete end of the possibility of democratization in China. Since then, Chinese people have lost their freedom of speech. Shortly thereafter, on July 20, 1999, then CCP leader Jiang Zemin initiated a large scale persecution against Falun Gong practitioners who follow the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. The CCP utilized various forms of torture, such as electric shock, force feeding, and injecting poison. What's even more horrifying is that the CCP has been involved in the forced organ harvesting from detained Falun Gong practitioners for profit. This heinous practice continues to this day. Despite extensive international reporting and pressure, the CCP continues to secretly arrest detained Falun Gong practitioners and harvest their organs. This persecution has lasted for 24 years. Since the persecution against Falun Gong, the CCP has also been committing severe human rights. Abuses against millions of Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslim ethnic groups in Xinjiang since 2017. The widespread nature of this persecution constitutes international crimes, particularly crimes against humanity and genocide. When CCP leader Xi Jinping visited Xinjiang on August 26, he claimed that the predominantly Muslim Uyghur region had achieved hard-won social stability and was moving towards unity, harmony, prosperity and well-being. However, the social stability that she referred to is built upon the foundation of widespread forced labor, illegal detention in re-education camps, brainwashing and persecution targeting the Uyghur population. To this day, the CCP has not officially acknowledged its action against the people of Xinjiang. Soon after the pandemic began in late November 2019, China saw the outbreak of the new coronavirus, plunging not only China but the entire world into a disaster. However, the CCP used all the techniques and authoritarian methods it had accumulated from its historical movements and prosecutions on the Chinese population. The zero COVID policy, which lasted for three years, resulted in countless families and tragedy. Infected patients were either forcibly taken to hospitals or locked inside their homes. Those who dared to speak out about the situation were either silenced or disappeared. According to reports in some severely affected areas during the pandemic, crematoriums were working nearly nonstop and the death toll was staggering. 
The CCP's measures exacerbated the situation. Additionally, the CCP even falsely blamed the U.S. for the origin of the virus, a tactic it has commonly used throughout its history. We have briefly reviewed the history of the CCP ruling China for over 70 years. It is evident that China's history is a history of violence, a history of bloodshed. This organization can no longer be described as a political regime, even calling it a terrorist organization falls short of describing its atrocities. Now, with the appearance of a blood red sky in the core political center of the CCP in Beijing, it coincides with the description of a red sky by the ancient Chinese people. How many people have lost their lives under the CCP's rule? How many injustice has been perpetrated? How many people have suffered unjustly? Perhaps the appearance of the red blood aurora is not a mere coincidence. History often foretells the future in ways that people may not believe. Perhaps it is a sign from above that the red reign of the CCP is on the verge of total collapse.